This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 922, recorded on July 29th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York... Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Daniel, I know you're going to touch on monkeypox, but I just wanted to tell you, I haven't had a thought in the last few days. Shouldn't we allow anyone who wants to to get monkeypox vaccine? Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, I would say yes. And I, I think the challenge is making that available. And I, I think we need to have a plan in place that makes that available. It's uh, <clears throat> it's a little disturbing. And yes, I am going to start by mentioning a little bit about monkeypox on our uh, This Week in Virology clinical update. But let me get right into it. Um, start with our quotation. Whenever you find that you are on the side of the majority, it's time to reform or pause and reflect. And that's Mark Twain. Um, I think it's by Mark Twain, right? I've realized over the last two years that a lot of things that you think are, are quoted by uh, one particular person may actually not be. <laughs> so, uh, and I appreciate all the uh, very kind and gentle emails uh, when I make a mistake there. So, all right, let's, let's start with the, with the monkeypox update. Over 20,000 cases outside of Africa. And I want to make that comment outside of Africa because we're going to get back to that. Um, the U.S. is, of course, leading a quarter of those, about 5,000 confirmed cases here in the U.S., um, over 1,200 here in New York, and the number of diagnoses is rising each day. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, monkeypox tracker, the New York City monkeypox data, we'll leave links in our show notes. Um, but here are the, the big news with regard to monkeypox, if those numbers weren't big enough. For the second time in two years, the WHO has taken the extraordinary step of declaring a global emergency. This time the cause is monkeypox, which has spread in just a few weeks outside of Africa to dozens of countries and infected tens of thousands of people. And um, the WHO's director general, and this is gonna be a week prior to when this drops. So when I say Saturday, I mean Saturday um, oh, well, about a week ago. Um, he actually overruled his panel of advisors who could not come to a consensus and went ahead and declared uh, the monkeypox a public health emergency of international concern. Um, and I'll point out this is a designation that WHO currently uses for only two other diseases, COVID-19 and HIV AIDS. Polio, actually. Isn't that interesting? No. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I, and I think one of the things, and I'll repeat back to this, a comment was that we are seeing here in the U.S. many of the infected in these countries report no known source of infection. So um, I'm going to keep harping on let's let's stop only testing a certain population and then saying we're only seeing it in that population that we tested. But um, I did want to mention right up front the article monkeypox virus infection in humans across 16 countries, April through June 2022, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, this is a report of 528 monkeypox infections diagnosed between April 27, June 24, 2022, at 43 sites in 16 countries. Um, <clears throat> among the 23 persons with a clear exposure history, the mean incubation period was seven days. So people keep asking now, like once you've been exposed, how long? On average, it's about a week, about seven days, but that can range from three to 20 days, as they saw in this study. Um, Co-infections, this is a big one, right? I keep saying, you know, Occam was not a physician, Hickam was. Um, same mistake early here, if you had something else, couldn't be the monkeypox. Co-infections in this study were right at the same rate I was sharing um, last week, 29%. So about one in three of those tested also had something else going on. So if you do that swab and you say, oh, it's just the herpes, it might not be just the herpes, it might be something else. Um, and also when they um, looked a little bit closer at the virus, um, there was a suggestion that this may have actually been circulating for some time um, outside of these African endemic areas, uh, possibly masquerading as other sexually transmitted infections. Um, Daniel. 
Can I make a couple of comments? Yeah, ju jump in, Vincent. Uh, first of all, I think uh, um, WHO needs to get some new advisors because I don't understand why <laughs> they're divided over this. This is obviously an issue. Uh, secondly, this has been monkeypox has been an issue in uh, Africa for years, hundreds of cases a year, and I don't see why we're not ready for it. And uh, finally, I, yeah, I was surprised that polio is uh, an international incident of concern, but I think HIV/AIDS should be also. What two hundred infections a minute globally? Uh, the, we can't let that fade from memory. Yeah, no, I appreciate you you bringing that up because um, you know we're we're seeing the same mistakes over and over again. Um, you know, we are still in the midst of the HIV/AIDS pandemic, and and it seems like you know just because it's not particularly interesting to read about in the popular press, uh, people forget about it. And a lot of times, I have to say, I'm sort of taking a little side here, is I see individuals infected and they just didn't even realize there was a risk there. Um, you know, I guess it's not sexy to write about it anymore. Um, um, uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to point this out. And this is, you know, I feel like we're making the same mistakes over and over again. And I want people to stop that. Remember, I, I joke um, and not in a funny way that, you know, early on with COVID, unless you could present that ticket from, uh, you know, a flight back from Wuhan, China, you just couldn't even get tested. Um, and right now we have this same bias in many parts of the country. And because of that, we are missing diagnoses. And when you miss diagnosis, you miss the opportunity to present to prevent the spread. So we are diagnosing monkeypox in children, in women, in men, in transgender and non-binary individuals, in gay as well as straight people, and in some cases, no obvious chain of transmission. So I just want to um, you know, just say this now. Monkeypox is not a gay disease. It's not an African disease. Monkeypox is an infectious disease. Um, and, and remember, um, how are you making the diagnosis? I hope everyone's getting the words right at this point. Um, you see a, uh, a rash, you're concerned about it. Um, in general, think about sending off that, that HSV, herpes, that VZV, that shingles. Uh, PCR, PCR, not culture. Stop saying culture, please. Send that off for universal transport medium. Um, and also you can send off the monkeypox uh, DNA, PCR. Um, just send off a non-cotton swab. Uh, those are dry. Put them in sterile containers. Some labs want them frozen or refrigerated. I'm not sure. I think they got about 20,000 years before that DNA degrades, so it should be okay at room temperature. Um, but yeah, go ahead. If you do not send off that test, you're not going to make the diagnosis. So, um, you know, with a 30% to 40% test positivity, we're not testing near enough. We're missing lots of cases. Um, you know, the only way we're going to really make progress here um, is by making those diagnoses. And again, you, you brought up, Vincent, early on, like, you know, what about vaccines? It is amazing to me, the same makes mistake again, you know, the, the DRC, West Africa, this is where there are cases of monkeypox. This is where they're actually seeing a significant percent of people not surviving, right? We're doing very well in the West when it comes to survival. Um, you know, what, what percent of folks are getting access to vaccines in Africa? And, and I'll, give you a, I'll give you several choices, but the correct answer is zero. Um, so, yeah, there no, no therapeutics, no vaccines in Africa. Again, we're sort of falling down on this. This whole idea, we sort of wait to too long and then respond inappropriately. So um, yeah, this is not a good um, example of our, our epidemic pandemic preparedness um, after COVID. So I, I, I'm going to sort of echo what you said, Vincent. Um, some of these folks, some of these organizations, they, they might need to put different people in, in charge to give a little bit better advice because uh, we just uh, failed, I think, horribly with COVID. And yeah, we're, we're failed again. And, and there's no reason that this should be happening. All Daniel, right. I hate to do this for you, but to you, but I think you should be on all these committees. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right. Children, COVID, and other vulnerable populations. Uh, remember, children are at risk from COVID. Over 1,000 children um, have died of COVID. And um, yeah, majority of those were this last winter due to that quote-unquote mild Omicron. So keep, keep that in mind when you send out those comments. Um, and come on, now's the opportunity to get those vaccinations in time for the start of school in the fall. Uh, children can die of COVID. Tens of thousands of children can end up in the hospital with COVID. Um, and children can get COVID. And four, eight weeks later, a chunk of them cannot be fully recovered. So let, let's keep that in mind. And um, 
I have to say, and this is in the vulnerable population um, category, uh, we got an email about a pregnant person last week whose provider told her, oh, don't worry about getting COVID. It's probably not going to be a big deal. Uh, you don't need to do anything. Just hope for the best. Um, and we've discussed repeatedly how a COVID infection during pregnancy is not great for the pregnant individual or the child and the role of vaccines. I just had a uh, situation yesterday where one of the nurses I work with, her daughter um, had gotten COVID and actually it triggered premature um, contractions. So um, remember this COVID is a problem for the individual who's pregnant. It's also potentially a problem for that child in preterm births as we talked about last time. So this week I wanna mention the um, paper Pregnancy Outcomes After SARS-CoV-2 Infection by Trimester, a large population-based cohort study. This was published in PLOS One. Um, and the researchers here conducted a retrospective cohort study, um, including all women with a positive SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR test during a non-ectopic singleton pregnancy um, between the February 21st, 2020 and July 2nd, 2021. We have a 2,753 women in this study. Each infected woman was matched to a non-infected pregnant woman by age, last menstruation date, sector, and socioeconomic status. And they found that third trimester infections, and in particular after 34 weeks of gestation, had a significantly greater risk of preterm birth um, with an adjusted odds ratio of 2.76 and 7.10 respectively. So getting infected during that last trimester was associated with a three to seven fold increased risk of preterm birth. So not great, something to worry about. All right, testing, um, use tests intelligently and remember, just as we're seeing again with monkeypox, you can have uh, more than one thing at the same time. And there's more out there than just COVID. Let's get into active vaccinations. And this is a, this is a heartwarming paper, if, if I can say that. The article, COVID-19 Vaccination Intent and Belief that Vaccination Will End the Pandemic. This was published in Emerging Infectious Diseases. Um, so this is the CDC peer-reviewed journal, as opposed to those MMWR reports, right? Here are the investigators um, look using an online survey, uh, March 12, um, 2021 in the Netherlands, um, and at this point, when they conducted this survey, um, 1.5 million of the 17.5 million residents of the Netherlands were partly or fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Uh, the survey was sent to 6,810 persons in the Netherlands, greater than 18 years of age. Um, this was an online survey panel. Uh, members from the survey panel were recruited by using random samples of names and address data. Um, this was hopefully going to represent uh, the general population of the Netherlands. Uh, and they found that the belief that the COVID-19 crisis um, will only end if many persons get vaccinated could statistically explain more than half of the variance in COVID-19 vaccination intentions. Um, and here I'll quote, the researchers found that it is striking that this belief seemed to be at least somewhat a better determinant of vaccination intentions than beliefs about personal protection against the vaccine preventable disease or beliefs about safety of vaccines, which have often been identified as the most essential psychosocial determinants of vaccination intention. So there's two ways to take this. Um, one is that people are, are much, um, much more upset about um, all the impacts COVID has had on life in general and, and, and more, more afraid and more disturbed and more troubled by those than actually the idea that they're gonna get sick, end up in the hospital with long COVID or die. Um, or maybe it's that they're, they're more concerned about society as a whole and, and the, the altruism of wanting their society to be in a better place. Um, I won't ask you which, you which you think it actually is, Vincent. I'm going to go with the Pollyanna approach. It's just people just really care about everyone else. And caring about everyone else, passive vaccination. Remember, Evu Sheld. I'm um, not really sure I understand why this is like sitting on shelves and expiring, uh, why everyone is so stingy. 
Um, you know, we are moving to a point in the pandemic where people are not wearing masks. I mean, I, I know they say, oh, here in New York, you've been encouraged to put those masks back on going indoors. Um, you know, me me and my wife, uh, we're probably like the only folks that actually do that at this point, right? I go in the supermarket and everyone else has their mask off. Um, people who are immunocompromised, moderate to severe, um, I'm not sure, and we had some emails about that last time or a couple weeks back about, well, I, I may have this person with a rheumatological condition on methotrexate, but the dose is not high enough to warrant protecting them with Evusheld. Um, I think we have to be a little bit more um, honest about the situational context here. Um, you know, we've talked before about the unvaccinated and the risk there, but the other big chunk is the elderly and the immunocompromised. So uh, there's no point letting a product that can offer an 85% reduction Reduction in even getting a symptomatic infection to sit on shelves and expire when we have the opportunity to protect these folks. So, uh, just that was, that was a little soapboxy, I realize in retrospect. All right. Now um, you actually go ahead and you test positive. And I think people have noticed I've simplified this framework a little. Um, it'll be coming out in a new publication. I just found out it was accepted for publication this morning in the European Society for um, Medicine Journal. Um, and the new framework, right? The early viral upper respiratory non-hypoxic phase. I like to point out that this is, sort of, is a progression. There's a timing issue, and I want to remind everyone here. Um, and I was a little surprised um, this week when I was in clinic, and one of the internists asked me, um, so Danny, does that Paxlovid, does it really work? Should I really be giving that to people? <laughs> Um, and after shocking him by mentioning that, you know, we're still seeing greater than 400 deaths a day, greater than 400 deaths a day, greater than 3,000 deaths a week. I mean, this is a 9-11 every week um, and averaging over 150,000 deaths a year. I did then go on to point out that the majority of these admissions are still the unvaccinated. That's one big group. Um, and also, and an overlap here, also those that did not get access to early treatment, that did not get things like Paxlovid and the others that we'll discuss, um, or possibly got harmful things such as, and I related that story of the gentleman in his 90s who was started on eight milligrams a day of dexamethasone on day two of his illness. So along this line, some real world experience, the article Antiviral Drug Treatment for Non-Severe COVID-19, a systematic review and network meta-analysis published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. These investigators identified 41 trials, which included almost 20,000 patients, um, and the findings supported what we've seen in the trials. And based on these studies, compared with standard care or placebo, um, malnupiravir and nirmatrelvir ritonavir, Paxlovid, um, each reduced risk of death and reduced risk of hospital admission. Um, and I agree with their comment in the discussion that most trials were conducted with unvaccinated patients before the emergence of the Omicron variant and the effectiveness of these drugs must be tested against in vaccinated patients and against newer variants. Um, I also wanted to shine a light on an underappreciated risk factor, underappreciated high risk population. Um, and we're gonna try to do more to educate people about this, but smoking is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events, disease severity, and mortality among patients hospitalized for SARS-CoV-2 infections, um, published also in PLOS One. Um, they reported that smokers had higher adjusted odds of death. Uh, that's a 1.41 adjusted odds ratio, um, ending up on a ventilator, 1.15, and increased risk of major adverse cardiovascular events, 1.27. This was independent of socio demographic characteristics, medical history. Um, so smoking was associated with a higher risk of severe COVID-19, including death. All right, so what should we be doing? Still number one, Paxlovid, and we'll, we'll continue to put links in our show notes to uh, therapeutic locators, drug interaction guides. Um, but this is an interesting one. I'm not sure what to fully make of this, so I will crit criticize this a little bit, but the article, Association of Nermatrelvir Ritonavir, Paxlovid, Treatment on Upper Respiratory SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR Negative Conversion Rates Among High-Risk Patients with COVID-19, uh, published in CID. 
Um, here, they are just looking at PCR testing, I'll point out a few times, and report that the median time for patients who converted from positive to negative um, RT-PCR was 10 days in patients treated in those first five days after symptom onset and 17 days in non-treated patients, respectively. Um, the proportions of patients with a negative um, PCR at day 15 was 89.7 in the treated, 42 per 42% in the non-treated. Um, now, at least they qualify. They do say this cohort study of high-risk patients with mild to moderate SARS COVID-19 found an association between Paxlovid treatment and accelerated negative RT-PCR respiratory SARS-CoV-2 conversion that might reduce the risk of viral shedding and disease transmission. Um, we really need to do those studies that are brought up there. Where, where's the viral culture data? Where are the quantitative plaque assays? Where are the contact tracing studies, right? So we, we really need those. And I understand the challenges of getting um, the rest of that data. Um, but yeah, this, again, we're two years into the pandemic. That's PCR data. All right. Number two, remember early IV remdesivir, not well operationalized. Um, number three, monoclonal therapy. We're left with bebtilovimab. Um, unless something happens, we'll be running out of this by the end of August. Um, you know, and unfortunately for a lot of individuals, this is a great choice, right? We've talked about those transplant patients, patients on a lot of complicated medications. Um, it's not always easy to do the Paxlovid, certain medications that you can't always stop. Uh, so it's nice to have this, particularly when we talk about how poorly operationalized the remdesivir is. Um, and again, we're in a lull right now. Now's the time to prepare. Now's the time to be ready for things to increase in the fall and the winter. And remember, malnupiravir, the last and least option with about a 30% reduction. Um, and I will mention the article, Safety and Efficacy of Malnupiravir in SARS-CoV-2 Infected Patients, a real-life experience published in the Journal of Medical Virology. Um, so these are the results of a retrospective cohort study with all the limitations involved. Um, patients treated with malnupiravir between the 10th of January and the 31st of March, 2022 at the University Hospital of Sassari. Malnupiravir was prescribed according to the Italian Agency of Drug Indications. So this is obviously a good study, Vincent, done in Italy. Um, in patients with recent symptom onset, so um, this is good early on, no need of oxygen supplementation with a high risk of disease progression. And they reported that early start of treatment with malnupiravir was associated with a reduced risk of disease progression, it was extremely safe. Um, authors, you know, comment all the limitations that I sort of... Um, tip my hat to. Um, but it's interesting. This drug is um, not being used very much. Um, I was just uh, communicating with uh, Justin Aaron, one of my colleagues at Columbia, just yesterday. And, you know, his, his question was, are you even using this? Uh, really underutilized. Um, you know, if you get to that point where you do not want to use Paxlovid because of drug drug interactions or other considerations, um, if Remdesivir is not accessible, which is true in much of the country. If the patient doesn't want to go through accessing the bebtilovimab, this is a very easy lift and is definitely better than doing nothing. Um, and remember, do no harm. Um, it's really hard for physicians to keep their hands in their pockets. Um, but negative data is important. And we have the uh, paper Anoxaparin. Um, for primary thromboprophylaxis in symptomatic outpatients with COVID-19, a randomized open-label parallel group multi-center phase three trial published in the Lancet Hematology. Um, this is a randomized open-label parallel group investigator initiated phase three trial uh, done at eight centers in uh, Switzerland and Germany. Um, outpatients aged 50 years or older with acute COVID were eligible. Um, if they presented with respiratory symptoms or they had a temperature higher than 37.5 C. Um, eligible participants received either the subcutaneous anoxaparin, a low molecular weight heparin, uh, 40 milligrams once daily for 14 days or nothing, no thromboprophylaxis. Uh, the primary outcome was um, a composite of any untoward hospitalization or all-cause death within 30 days of randomization. At the formal um, predefined interim analysis for efficacy, when 50% of the total uh, study population was enrolled, uh, the Data Safety Monitoring Board recommended early 
termination of the trial, um, really considered low probability that they would show any um, superiority here. So, um, you know, that a lot of folks want to jump in. They want to do something during those first two weeks. We've already talked about what makes a difference. This is something that does not make a difference. All right. Then in some cases, there is progression to the severe to critical, the early inflammatory lower respiratory hypoxic phase. Uh, this, this is when you consider steroids at the right time in the, in the right patient. This is when you consider that anoxaparin, the anticoagulation, at the right time in the right patient at the proper dose. Um, perhaps pulmonary support, maybe remdesivir if you're still in a little bit of the window. Um, diminishing returns, some of our immunomodulation, tocilizumab and the other, avoiding those unnecessary antibiotics and unproven therapies. We are uh, getting a little bit killed here with the antimicrobial resistance that has followed from COVID. Um, yeah, I, I, I was actually, a patient was joking with me about how uh, people don't seem to understand that antibacterial agents don't really work against them viruses. So I will include the paper here, another one, statin and aspirin as an adjuvant therapy in hospitalized patients with SARS-CoV-2, a randomized clinical trial. This is the data from the RESIST trial published in the BMC Infectious Disease, single center, open label, randomized control trial. Uh, so we had 900 um, RT-PCR positive COVID-19 patients requiring hospitalization randomly designed into these three groups. You got your Lipitor, your atorvastatin, or you got your aspirin, or you got both. And this was then compared to a standard of care where you, you did not get any of these. And the primary outcome was clinical deterioration. And I will, I will mention that the certain um, August medical centers just decided that the standard of care would be aspirin and statin, um, and then published these sort of you know, retrospective stuff about how uh, you know, after the surge was over and they started doing that, things got better. Well, after the surge was over, things got better, by the way. And here is some data. They found that among patients admitted with mild to moderate COVID-19 infection, Additional treatment with aspirin, atorvastatin, or a combination did not prevent clinical deterioration. So just, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. A, a reporter called me the other day about something. We won't mention that it was Paxil Rebound. Um, you know, and she said, you know, these other people I talked to, they're asking me that, that they don't believe their eyes. And I think we've talked about believing your eyes and confirmation bias and all that other. You, you need science. You need to do a proper trial. All right, <laughs> the late phase. Um, and Vince and I have talked about this challenging question that keep going, what percentage of people end up with long COVID um, and why different investigations generate different percentages. But the article, post-COVID-19 conditions among children 90 days after SARS-CoV-2 infection um, was published here in um, JAMA Network Open. Here the investigators are going all the way out to 90 days, right? We talked about four weeks, eight weeks, this is now 90 days post-infection, um, well past the original four-week definition. And these are the results of a prospective cohort study conducted in 36 emergency departments in eight countries between March 7th, 2020 and January 20th, 2021. And this study followed the strengthening the reporting of observational studies in epidemiology or these strobe reporting guidelines. And they included 1,884 SARS-CoV-2 positive children who completed 90-day follow-up. 1,686 of these children were frequency matched by hospitalization status, country and recruitment date with 1,701 SARS-CoV-2 negative controls. Um, the SARS-CoV-2 status was classified as positive um, if a nucleic acid test performed on a swab sample obtained from the NARES, nasopharynx or oral cavity was positive at the index ED visit or during the subsequent 14 days. Um, participants with negative nucleic acid tests constituted the comparison group. Um, median age, I thought this was pretty interesting, three years. So these are, these are little ones. Um, and that interquartile range was zero to 10, um, sort of evenly split between um, boys and gals um, with the most uh, common index um, symptom being fever, followed by cough, rhinorrhea, and congestion. And they found in this cohort study um, with 90-day follow-up, about 6% of the patients reported post-COVID conditions. It's about 10% in the kids that ended up hospitalized. 
um, and characteristics associated with post-COVID um, conditions included being hospitalized um, 48 hours or more, so that's going to increase your risk a little bit, having four or more symptoms reported at the index ED visit, and being 14 years of age or older. So we're, we're seeing that trend towards older individuals being higher risk, hospitalized um, versus non-hospitalized, about double the risk. Um, now, before getting excited and hanging our hat on these numbers, I'm just going to point out, if you look closer at the data, um, this cohort found that although 10% of children hospitalized with acute SARS-CoV-2 infections and 5% in total of those discharged from the ED reported post-COVID conditions at 90 days, these rates were only slightly higher than the rates among the SARS-CoV-2 negative controls. So looking at the hospitalized kids with or without COVID at 90 days, 10% and 5% respectively were still reporting issues. Looking at individual symptoms other than fatigue, there's still a lot of overlap for all the different health um, problems. Now, I know everyone wants that, that magical percentage, but we're still, um, we're still left sort of searching for that, I'll say. All right. Also, a little bit more on long COVID. The article Symptoms and Risk Factors for Long COVID in Non-Hospitalized Adults was published in Nature Medicine. Um, these are the results of a retrospective matched cohort study using a UK-based UK primary care database, Clinical Practice Research Data Link, ORUM, to determine symptoms that are associated with concern confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection beyond 12 weeks, right? So we're really starting to stretch that out now in non-hospitalized adults and the risk factors associated with developing persistent symptoms. Uh, they selected um, 486,149 adults with confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection and one, almost 2 million propensity score matched adults with no evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, outcome, outcomes included 115 individual symptoms as well as long COVID as a composite outcome of 33 symptoms um, using the WHO clinical case definition. Um, and what is that? I, I think I'll take this moment. Uh, the WHO defines post-COVID-19 as a condition characterized by symptoms impacting everyday life, such as fatigue, shortness of breath, and cognitive dysfunction, which occur after a history of probable or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, WHO, a clinical case definition of post-COVID-19 condition by a Delphi consensus. Um, I don't know if our listeners know what a Delphi consensus is. It's, it's a formal um, term for a bunch of people got in a room and agreed. So I think it's like the- Does that ever happen? Uh, apparently, apparently that, that's how they come up with this. It's the Oracle of Delphi consensus. We all sit around and say, I'm very wise and august and, and looking at the lack of evidence here, I'm going to give you a very firm definition of long COVID. So, um, I know we have a lot of groups out there saying, why don't you sort of sit back a little bit and make sure all those definitions are a little bit couched in the fact that you, uh, you need to be humble about how, how much do we know? How much do we not know? All right, and I will say a total of 62 symptoms were significantly associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection after 12 weeks. Um, and actually, I was very interested by all the impacts of getting COVID on sexual health um, with ejacu ejaculation difficulty, um, you know, 2.63, reduced libido, 2.36. Um, really worth looking at figure one in this paper because I know all the anti-vaxxers are talking about, oh, but vaccines are going to have all these negative effects. Well, boy, getting COVID um, is going to have a lot of negative effects on your sexual health. So keep that in mind. Um, and all right, and, and maybe monkeypox is reminding us of our, um, our blinders, our narrow focus. Um, but as I've been saying for a couple of years now, no one is safe until everyone is safe. We, we live in a, in, a, in a world, in a global community. Um, we have travel, we, we interact back and forth. Um, so, you know, the, the most selfish thing a person can do is worry about the world. Um, and I do want everyone to pause the recording right here and go to parasiteswithoutborders.com. Uh, click on the donate button. Uh, when this drops, it'll be the final days of our fundraiser for Foundation International Medical Relief of Children, uh, focusing on supporting our clinic in the Baduda District of Eastern Uganda. You know, Daniel, with all our amazing science and clinical and technology, which admittedly is not equally distributed over the world, it's really embarrassing that these viruses are doing this to us. There's no reason why this should be happening. No, I, I, I completely agree. 
All right, it's time for your questions for Daniel. You can send yours to Daniel at microbe.tv. Chuck writes, my up-to-date vaccinated 65-year-old spouse who was symptomatic, very severe cough for three weeks, positive with COVID on May 11th, is a singer, musician, voice teacher. She completed a regimen of Paxlovid. On June 23rd, she began experiencing headaches and extreme sound and noise sensitivity, which continues today. For instance, crowded rooms of conversation on occasion are amplified to the point where she must leave the room. Single musical tones often present with additional tones as if hearing chords with only a single note played. She's seen an ENT who recommended, one, treatment with a diuretic, ruling out Meniere's disease, two, head MRI, and three, depending on one and two, possibly installing tubes. Question, do you have thoughts on any connection between COVID-19 and or its treatment, which could explain this possibly career-ending situation my wife is facing? Yeah, this is this is tough, and I have a, a number of individuals with long COVID, very very similar presentations. Um, uh, sometimes it can be they they can't look at a screen, they have to wear sunglasses whenever it's bright, um, they have to really protect themselves from from any kind of loud noises. Um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, this is something um, this hypersensitivity to sound or light, other. Um, of sensory input is something we're seeing. Um, I just saw uh, an individual yesterday, was, and I really like to kind of go through because I'm trying to understand what's happening. And, and in their case, you know, they had the acute COVID. It was relatively mild, um, that initial case. And it was right at about 20 days after that, that they really started to see that the, these symptoms um, start to develop. Um, they were treated for a short course with steroids, actually had a little bit of recovery, but, um, you know, they they then uh, rebounded right back to where they were before when the steroids were were stopped, um, you know. And and what I what I really shared with them was this sort of humility of we're just trying to understand what what's happening here. Um, this certainly is being seen after COVID. We have a lot of ideas. The recovery trials um, are really seem to be ramping up now. Um, but um, yeah, it, this is this you want you want to actually get into not just an ENT who's looking at this through typical ENT, um, but you really want to get connected with someone who's um, seeing a lot of post-COVID people um, and trying to work with them. Uh, you know, we're, we're we're doing stuff that we've done for many years as physicians. Um, a lot of what we do, we don't have a great you know randomized control trial, um, but there's certain things that seem to be working in certain patients. I know how embarrassing that is for me. That sort of um, you know. Uh, confirmation bias approach to medicine um, that I'm, I'm suggesting there. Um, but no, work with someone who's been working with a lot of patients because there are some things that can sometimes be helpful in this context. Kate writes, my husband is a long-term type 1 diabetic, recently experienced acute kidney injury from a couple of medications he was given. He was monitored in the hospital a few days, given a course of prednisone, which he just finished. Because of the prednisone and his kidney injury, we've been very concerned about COVID, so are secluding ourselves like it's 2020 again. His nephrologist did emphasize that it was important for him not to become ill or injured in the next several months as his kidneys heal. His last EGFR was 14, having climbed from 11 at the lowest, normally in the mid-50s. How long might it be before his immune system returns to normal? Would it make sense for him to have every shell, or will his four Moderna shots protect him again sometime in the future? Yeah, that was... I, I you went right to what was going through my head as you sort of described this, sort of asking, you know, if, if the nephrologist is saying, boy, for the next several months, your, your husband is moderately immunocompromised, um, that would make sense to actually be having that discussion about whether Evusheld is an additional therapy to, to throw on. All right. Now we have two monkeypox questions, <laughs> Daniel. Ida writes, in last week's clinical update, I was under the impression that both you and Vincent said those with monkeypox can be out and about, but I was under the impression they need to be isolated for two to four weeks, at least while they have active lesions. I read to wear full covered clothing and double mask if they need to be out for an emergency or medical appointment. Can you say what we should be counseling patients, what kind of PPE we need for our office and staff, and what the treatments are, especially for the pain that I hear can be beyond brutal? Yeah, so this is a great question, and, and hopefully it's a good forum for us to discuss that. Um, so first, starting off with what are we recommending for a patient who has the monkeypox? What should they do? Um, so the, the challenge with monkeypox is the two sides of, you know, it can be up to three weeks after exposure before a person starts to develop um, any symptoms. 
Um, also, then once you get the monkeypox, it can be about four weeks. That's probably a, a fair average of having um, infectious lesions being contagious, right? So, boy, we had five days with, with COVID and we came and do that. We certainly can't get to 10 days anymore. Um, and when we suggested 14, it was like 1% of the population would ever do that. So here's an individual for, now they've been infected with the monkeypox for four weeks are potentially um, contagious. So um, ideally you say you need to isolate, um, but four weeks for most individuals is unrealistic. So if they do go out, what are the recommendations? They should cover those lesions. So um, yeah, long, you know, covering the lesions with actual you know band aids or um, non adherent gauze or whatever you're going to do to keep them covered. Uh, wear long pants, long sleeve shirts. Um, this is a contact in general, um, but there can be exceptions. Um, there is that that rare or uncommon respiratory spread. So we do, the recommendation is to wear a mask. These individuals wear a mask when they go out as well, which um, now I tell them, you'll sort of blend in with, uh, you know, me and my wife, I guess, and the three other people wearing a mask in the supermarket. Um, and again, um, you know, this is a contact. So um, you want to use a lot of judgment, but this is going to be a challenge. And this is why I'm a little bit concerned about this. Four weeks is a really long time. And Eric writes, I'm a member of the LGBT community who found TWIV in January 2000. A two-year commitment with Moderna vaccine trial is up next month. My health care provider specializes in services to the LGBT community. While still sexually active, I've been abstinent during the monkeypox outbreak. Last week, I went in for regular testing, requested monkeypox vaccine, but was declined because CDC regulations require a known or highly suspected exposure. In other words... The only way to become eligible for the vaccine is to have sex. A few of us here in the Boston area are trying to wrap our heads around this requirement, but must be missing something. Can you explain a PS? Abstinence is not going to work. <laughs> Okay. It, it is a little circular, isn't it? <laughs> you, so, hey, you're doing the right thing and refraining from sex and you want to get your vaccinations to be protected so you can go on and, and, you know, just be a human being and do the things that human beings do. And it's like, oh, wait, you're behaving yourself. You're not eligible for the vaccine. We're going to give it to Johnny over here who can't stop having sex despite the fact that we're in the midst of a monkeypox pandemic. Um, this would be like, I'm thinking about only vaccinating the people who won't wear masks. I don't know. Those would be the people that don't want to get vaccinated. But uh, part of this is a shortage supply. Um, I think there are about 800,000 monkeypox vaccines headed our way that uh, just were a little bit delayed by an FDA inspection. Um, but we, you know, we need millions of vaccines because uh, I hate to tell you in a country of 400 million, more than a million people are having having sex and, and contacting other people. And, and I think it's short-sighted to think that we only have to uh, vaccinate a tiny select population. And yeah, you're being penalized for doing the right thing. And I'm not sure that's the best way to approach this. So Daniel, you think maybe when supply issues are resolved, we can broaden the, the vaccination with monkeypox vaccines? I, I certainly think that we need to. And, and by the way, I, I say monkeypox vaccines, but these are vaccines actually made for smallpox. They, they just happen to protect against monkeypox as well. Yeah, that's I, I, I make that distinction myself that, you know, the ACAM 2000, which is really a very much a, a smallpox vaccine and, and a number of issues, unfortunately, and, and the Ginios um, by Bavarian Nordic, which I think of more as a better tolerated uh, monkeypox vaccine. Um, but yeah, that, that's exactly the, the point that you mentioned. That's COVID-19 clinical update number 125 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe.